Let's talk about manufacturing. One of the big four agenda of President Uhuru Kenyatta's second term in government in office. And he said, big four. What, what are the four? Housing, food security, manufacturing, and... Agriculture. Health. See, that is food security. Health. 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 <laughs> Health. Yeah. Joining us to talk about the manufacturing conversation is the CEO of the Kenya Association of Manufacturers, Phyllis Wakiaga. Good morning. Morning, Eric. Thank you very much for joining us this morning. Welcome to the hot seat of the Situation Room. Mm. And uh, we want to welcome you. Make it just warm enough to understand what the manufacturing sector is doing and how far you are in delivering the promise of an industrialized country. See, so didn't like to hear this, but part of our vision 2030 <laughs> is to make us what? A middle-income okay. industrialized country by the year 2030. Mm. How many years to 2030? Like eight. Eight Bus. now. Yeah. Bus. How close are we to that? Um, thanks for that. Mm. Uh, of course, the ambition of Vision 2030 was to deliver a middle-income economy with a high quality of life for citizens. And the ambition for manufacturing was to see it contribute to 15% of the GDP by then. Mm. Um, it was also picked up in the medium-term plan, uh, which is really the basis of uh, the Big Four agenda. Manufacturing was prioritized as a sector there. So where we are, um, unfortunately, we've seen the performance of the sector decline. Um, at a time, the contribution of manufacturing used to be almost 11, 12%, but it's now dropped down to 7.2% contribution to GDP. The output has increased over the years, but at a much slower pace than other sectors. Uh, so that definitely shows that the declining performance of the manufacturing sector is something that we think we should be concerned about mm. uh, because of the ability of the sector to create jobs and its multiplier effect. Uh, if you look at the job numbers also, there's been a slowdown in the, in the, in the creation of jobs uh, within the sector. So the reason we still think this is important and that it's important to deliver the manufacturing opportunity is because of the impact it has uh, in society. For countries that have been able to industrialize or really grow their economies, they've done it by really having strong industrial bases, manufacturing mm. bases, and having the ability to then lift up the livelihoods of people because of the linkages and uh, what it can do within the country. Mm. It's interesting to hear that uh, the contribution of the manufacturing sector to the GDP is actually declining. From 12% to 7%, that is a sharp decline. That's like falling down the... Uh, what's that gorge in uh, Naivasha? <laughs> that one. That one. 14-4. Mm. Mm -hmm. 14 fold is not in my version, no, but it's okay. It's okay. It's something like that. It's okay. <laughs> it's the Hell's Gate, right? <laughs> just falling down well, the gorge. You shouldn't worry. Uh, I'm not worried at it's all. It's not fun. It's one of these questions it's where they even award you for effort. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> you get 5% yes. for just answering for the answering. question. Thank yes. you. Mm. That is right. <laughs> why, why would we have such a heavy uh, drop? Well, yes, you've said that the, yeah. the, the output has grown, yes. but the overall contribution of the manufacturing sector to GDP is actually shrinking. Why? Um, it's shrinking from, for a number of reasons. Mm. First of all, if you put it in comparison with other sectors of the economy, other sectors are growing, whether it's IT and some of the services sectors, they have been growth in those sectors. But even when Vision 2030 was uh, being put in place, there was an understanding that other sectors would grow, but there was still the expectation that manufacturing should grow more mm. because of the nature of our country. We have a lot of youth getting out of uh, school who need jobs and manufacturing has the ability to actually create those jobs and, 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 and spur creation of jobs in other sectors. So why do we think it's been declining? Mm. Um, one of the main issues is the issue around the competitiveness of the local manufacturing sector and the cost of doing business. Uh, the reality is that we operate in a global economy. So you're not manufacturing and competing against yourself, you're competing against the world. Uh, so if our cost of production is higher, uh, goods coming from other parts of the world are then able to uh, access the market at more affordable prices. So that has been a big uh, challenge. Mm. And we have enumerated uh, what those costs look like. Um, if you look at our cost differential, it's at about 12%. Uh, of, of, of higher costs than comparator economies that uh, sell goods within our country. The other thing is our tax policy. Uh, we've seen the tax policy also um, be punitive towards production in a number of cases. 
uh, taxes being introduced, for example, excise on certain products that are considered intermediate products or raw materials, uh, like packaging, mm. that definitely does have an impact. Uh, in certain products, also the excise inflation adjustments in some of those products has also had an impact. Um, another issue has been, of course, um, sometimes challenges in access to markets. Uh, we can't rely only on the Kenyan market and we export significantly around the region um, and, and, and you do see sometimes that we do have challenges at EAC level in terms of the non-tariff barriers um, and, and, and the challenges to access some of this market. So that has slowed down the growth in, 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 in these areas. Mm. The case for industrialization or manufacturing on a very high level is clear. Yes. I don't think anybody has to debate and say, would it make sense for any country or any economy on the globe? I think that we've gone beyond that point. Even when you're looking at the 1700s, when the Industrial Revolution took place in the Americas and Western Europe, nobody was asking permission mm -hmm. that can we move people from farms to cities? Can we move beyond coal and now go to the locomotive? Nobody was asking for permission. They just went ahead and did it. It would, as, it would appear, though, that sure, we are working on this side of time, mm -hmm. but it still seems as though we still have not gotten the rationale behind why any economy that wants to survive in the global situation must industrialize. It doesn't, it, there's, there's, it's, it's clear cut as to that it must happen. So why wouldn't it be in your opinion, mm -hmm. that we are not making deliberate steps, whether it is making the environment more conducive in terms of inputs and production and mm -hmm. things like that, as government, as otherwise, steps towards this. Mm. I think for us, that's where we keep uh, driving and having this conversation because uh, yesterday we, we launched um, our industrial or manufacturing manifesto, which is basically policy proposals we are making to the incoming governments on how they can deliver the manufacturing opportunity. And we had different political players in the room and all of them agreed and said, we are agreed on the fact that manufacturing is a priority, that it should be something mm. that countries focus on. But I think where the disconnect is, is to fix manufacturing, you need a very deliberate focus and an end to end approach. It can't be you fix one thing and leave the other. It's kind of like a cog. Mm -hmm. It has to all be moving together at the same time. So the commitments, the rhetoric is great, but unless it's backed up with end-to-end -end full action across all levels, the progress will be much slower. So if you look at things like, for example, when we say the cost, you say the cost of power, you talk about the cost of transport and infrastructure, the cost of logistics and, 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 and all that. But if you fix one to a certain percentage and not fix the other things, it, it, it has an impact. If you look at our tax policy, um, a lot of the tax uh, we've seen coming out uh, of, 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 uh, of, of national treasury has not been tax that encourages production. Mm -hmm. Because if, for example, you're taxing an intermediate product or something required in production, when we have VAT refunds delayed, uh, you're basically disincentivizing people from thinking about exporting their products. So unless you're really having a coherent policy that is end to end, it is hard to drive that manufacturing growth. Um, as we see today, we don't have as a country a standalone manufacturing policy or a standalone taxation policy. And those are some of the key instruments mm. that can be utilized to drive production. Another big thing is the common external tariff. Uh, the common external tariff sits at the EAC level, and it's been a discussion we've had for the last five years mm. on the renewal of, of, the, of the tariff. What happens every five years, the EAC countries have to update the tariff mm -hmm. because there are changes in terms of their domestic production and what is happening uh, to spy industrialization. It's been a five-year journey and we've not updated it. We are still stuck at what should the highest band be and countries are not agreed on that. So it's these small things put together that eventually add up to us being unable to grow the sector. The other one I'd speak to is the issue of unpredictability. Um, in, in the report we released yesterday, uh, we did a regulatory audit last year. Mm. We have 14 sectors within the association. And some sectors like food sectors, you, you need 41 permits to be able to operate your food business. So in countries where manufacturing is progressive, they have streamlined their regulatory uh, bodies to be able to align and support production. If I need 41 permits, it's, it's sometimes not even the cost, but the administrative burden of going around applying for all these permits can really be a disincentive. 
and can also make it more difficult for even small businesses to start up. Is, is there, sorry, go sorry, go ahead. No, 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 please, Eric. Is there an argument somewhere or a, a debate somewhere in government mm -hmm. on the importance of industrialization or supporting the manufacturing sector? Like, is, is there one side of government that does not really see the importance of manufacturing, uh, of putting all these things that you're saying aligned, while another one says we should do this? So that you can say that the stronger side is one that has been winning. Because I I keep asking this question. This country, the president is somebody who has been head of treasury. The chief of public service is somebody who has been in the treasury. People who are senior in government are people who have actually dealt with these conversations that we are dealing with today. Why would we be getting to a point where we have, okay, so as we, every time we talk about increasing taxation, we are touching on the things that are going to impact on a key sector of our economy. Why? I think What's that disconnect? Who's, think who's fighting whom? We, we might need to walk back to what the real issue is because right. the real issue is the macroeconomics. Um, if you look at the challenge to why the cost of production has gone up, it's the fiscal distress. It's the budget deficits. It's the expenditure at government level. And what that leads to is that there's a need to collect more taxes. And when there's a need to collect more taxes, Taxes come from us, the citizens. Mm. And unfortunately, the manufacturing sector is one of the easiest points it's of collection. Fruit. It's a low-hanging fruit. If you look at the statistics, our sector contributes, um, as we said, now 7.2% to GDP, but we contribute 18% to tax revenue. If you look at manufacturing, I mean agriculture, it's 34% GDP, 2% to tax revenue. So that disproportionate uh, position of, of, of the manufacturing sector is a challenge. And that, that, that ability to collect constantly from the sector inhibits the sector's growth. The ability or the uh, lack of creativity in other ways in go. which there, there can be <laughs> proper revenue going into the economy. Because it seems to me as though what you're trying, what the situation is, well, since we can't think of any other way to bring in revenue into the economy, let's tack these people to within an inch of their lives. Whereas we know for a fact that you are never going to be able to survive as an economy via taxes alone. It's not going to happen. But we see that those the sector which essentially could bring about a rise in revenue into the economy is the one that's being taxed the most. But, 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 we don't mind paying taxes. But either. honestly, mm -hmm. this is something that the experts in the Ministry of Finance and Treasury understand even better than we do. Mm -hmm. So the real question is, why do they do it? They even know the consequences of what they're doing by constantly raising taxes so that the living daylights are taxed out of us. They understand this. They know that it's counterproductive. So why do it? That's the question. I think it's where we are. The reality that we have debts to pay and they need the money. So for now, uh, the priority is to raise revenues. But we keep saying there are other ways to raise revenue. If we raise production... If for a period of time we say that we're allowing us to support manufacturing production, bring in raw materials at affordable costs, even have in place in countries that have grown like Egypt, export incentives, because you put in an incentive, you par exports, in the process you get revenue uh, back to the country. So that creative thinking, and I, I, I don't want to discount fully that Treasury has not listened. We do have sessions with them where we sit down, we look at the CET, we try and figure out what needs to change here and there. But if they holistically took a lot more of those proposals in t and put them in place, I think the impact would be more far-reaching. But Phyllis, the, the discussion about the debt that we have and the, this money which we don't have, and yet this money which we don't have is also constantly being stolen, how people steal things which don't exist, this is something that I find a bit puzzling. Yet, you don't even need to be very imaginative. Mm -hmm. We had a president called Mwai Kibaki who decided at some point to simply stop capital projects. Just stop. stop yeah. that this, huge infra this, this huge thing that requires a lot of money. Mm -hmm. Stop. Mm -hmm. Okay? Because you stop it, that outflow is stopped. That is it, yeah. This money that we keep talking about, that we keep needing to borrow so that we can do the same thing and end up in even greater debt and tax our people more. You see, it's like a deliberate move to sink us deeper and deeper and deeper into debt. Whereas these useful projects that we have could be halted. It doesn't mean they can't be continued later. But in all honesty, mm. 
Those are the choices I think we have to make. Yes. Mm. Let me tell you where I'm going with what I'm saying. Yes. Yeah? When the evolution came about, the Kenya Association of Manufacturers, in something that I consider the, one of the most visionary things I've actually ever seen in this country, uh, together with the Commission Revenue Allocation, did that, yeah. yes, got together mm. and they did something beautiful. I'm calling it beautiful because they demarcated, they demarcated this country and they were speaking to county governments, but more so the lawmakers mm. and trying to get them to understand how it was imperative for them to not only understand laws, but also learn to create them so that when these county governments come into fruition, they are able to benefit from it. Now, when you talk of manufacturing, mm. every time we talk of manufacturing, you think of Nairobi. Unfortunately. Maybe Mombasa, maybe Eldred, really maybe Kisumu, maybe. Mm -hmm. Yet, we had a conversation with uh, one governor of uh, like Kipi. He was sitting exactly where you're sitting. Mm. And we listened to what he is doing. Yes. Now, the legislation that Kenya Manufacturer uh, Association of Manufacturers tried to get the counties to understand. Yeah, this industrialization we speak of, mm. given the diversity and the specificity of what every county has, mm. would it not have been better driven into the counties, given the strengths that counties have, if they had understood the import of all this, so that this focus on Nairobi, one, wouldn't be there, the employment everybody wants to come to Nairobi wouldn't be there because this dream of industrialization would actually be taking place in your own backyard. So what was the outcome of all those meetings? City, you're right. In fact, at the beginning of the counties, what we did is first we did county business agendas. For all the 47 counties, we sat with the business community, the governors, the people on the ground, and identified what the opportunities for manufacturing and different sectors are within the county. Hmm. Then we went ahead with CRA, mm -hmm. that, that time I, was, I just joined come and we developed um, business laws that would facilitate uh, development of industries at county level. And we did it for all the 47 counties, sat with the county assemblies, got them to understand what it would take to spur industrialization in the counties and started getting them to adopt the laws through the county assemblies. Unfortunately, as we sit, we are moving to 2022 with counties taxing you for moving your product from one county to another. We've tried to unlock that issue for the last 10 years because you can imagine, I want to move my goods from Nairobi to another county. I have paid in Nairobi. When I move to the next county, they expect me to pay for advertising. They want me to pay CES and CES is paid at the county of origin. We have a recent case of Farmer's Choice and you saw the statement I issued on that where Farmer's Choice was being charged CES yet in Nairobi County, yet the county where they came from, they have already paid CES for where they got the product and sourced the product. So the reality is, as we've said, everyone knows manufacturing is the way to go, believes mm. it, mm. says it, but in action and policy, I see it even at county level, sometimes happening in the opposite direction. And I want to understand, we still want to understand why, what's the disconnect, the situation on the ground between the political leaders who actually understand everything that you're talking about. The cabinet secretary in charge of industrialization is your predecessor at the Kenya Association of Manufacturers campaigned for the very same things that you're campaigning for today. So what happens? Our guest this morning, Phyllis Wakiaga, the CEO of the Kenya Association of Manufacturers. We're talking about what Kenya needs for industrial growth and job creation, delivering the manufacturing opportunity. Phyllis, one of the headlines that we're looking at uh, in uh, the six o'clock hour when you look at newspaper headlines is what CT found on the Business Daily. It talks mm -hmm. about uh, what was that headline again, City? 60% of Kenya's export used to buy China goods. Okay. Mm -hmm. We are a net importer, basically. Mm -hmm. But of the, the volume of goods that we export, what percentage of that is manufactured goods? Um, unfortunately, 28% of our exports are manufactured. Uh, if you look at countries like Vietnam, it's 83% of their exports. Egypt, almost 50% of, of their exports. So a big opportunity we are losing out on is the export opportunity. Uh, because the reality is we are just above 50 million Kenyans. That's not a big enough market uh, for a manufacturing sector. So what we need to be looking at is export markets. So the fact that only 28% is exported, it means we are exporting a lot of resource-based products. So the typical tea, if we value add only 3 or 4% of our tea locally, 97, the last figures I checked mm. goes uh, without value addition. So the real issue is how do we export more? And we can only export more if we can produce competitively. 
because the export market you're competing on a global scale. Mm. So if you lump up all your taxes and everything to that product and put it in the export market, you can't compete. So we have to really look at fixing the issue of competitiveness and productivity. Looking at, at the level. end goal, Phyllis, yeah. looking at the end goal, it would appear to me then that you have to make deliberate steps towards this. So you say that, you know, and I'm guessing that it's historically, that's where we get some of these proverbs like cut your coat according to your cloth and mm -hmm. kind of things. If you know where you want to go, we understand that if we want to compete globally, mm -hmm. if we want to be able to have more in terms of what is circulating in the economy and ramp up some of these numbers that you have to make a deliberate effort you have to take deliberate steps right now in order to create this thing you have to lower the cost of inputs you have to make a more conducive environment for people to be able to do business and mm -hmm. manufacture locally people who are setting up these businesses have to be able to have it done in a conducive environment not have 41 permits for example to have a business running mm -hmm. okay reduce it cut it in half even mm -hmm. and that's what i'm saying isn't yeah, it that these deliberate moves must be made yes i think uh, uh, where i've reached is i think we need to make a case for a manufacturing delivery unit mm. if we say that manufacturing is a priority can we have a clearly a clearly defined delivery plan around it so that it's end to end because the reality of of of, of the government as it sits today is cs betty has done a lot and mm. that i must commend in terms of getting the issues that we take to her table address and trying to do what she can the thing with government is things sit in different areas. If you look at the 41 permits, some are at county level, others are five other regulatory bodies that have been created across different ministries. Mm -hmm. So that lack of coherence, I think, affects the ability to deliver fully on this agenda. So if we had a way to have a clear delivery unit, we say as a country, what are we choosing as priorities? And for those priorities, have a clear delivery plan around them. Because this is a long game. It's not something, manufacturing will not happen overnight. Mm. But it requires us to stay true to the vision. If we decide that this is the path, this is what needs to be done. And we hold ourselves accountable and we hold government accountable and work to But that it. delivery secretariat that you're uh, championing would just be the same as the Vision 2030 Delivery Board and Secretariat. So we have a long-term game plan here called Vision 2030. It's not even anchored in law. There is no law that says that we have Vision 2030 True. in this country. Yeah. Eight years to go. We have a board and a secretariat mm. not delivering. If we are to take dairy products to Kandambongoman in DRC, definitely we need, we need to process. We do. Mm. So what's the game plan? Um, <laughs> anyway, that's why I, I think let's, let's just say that that's why we did launch the manufacturing manifesto yesterday. We are still keen and believe that <coughs> for the government coming into place, because the reality is in August, we will have an election and we will have a new government. We want them to prioritize this for the next five years. Um, there have been attempts. There is no government, by the way, since independence that has not talked about manufacturing, that has not tried to prioritize it. But we are saying, can we this time, because of the urgency, <laughs> because <laughs> no, of the bulging youth population, you know, really, Phyllis, because Phyllis, of the fiscal you, deficit, can you know, we prioritize you know really strange, a sector what, that will make a what difference? What is truly strange, even during the era of structural adjustments yes. and a command economy, mm -hmm. Our manufacturing sector was really vibrant. Yes. We were actually the largest exporter to this particular region. region. So it's like we've and, taken... And you've seen that tide changing? Because yes. now we are actually getting imports from other countries yes. into in the our region. country, which is not... Uh, it's a good thing for EAC, but as a country, we need to soul search and say, what is our vision? Yep. We have the Africa continental free trade area coming up. You remember when we when 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 WTO came in and we opened up our markets, mm. and that's when a lot of manufacturing started happening in countries like Egypt. With AFCTA, we have other competitors coming in. As soon as this comes into place, if we do not put our house in order, we will now completely not have a manufacturing sector. But this is deliberate, really. <laughs> uh, I mean, where you sit, yes. you're going to be knocking your head against the wall continuously, yes. because you can plan, you can have a vision. But if those within government who are charged with this mandate to actually see it done don't want it done, mm. what really are you going to do? Yeah. The, the, the thing is, of course, it requires political goodwill. And as we've said, because it's a long game, it requires heavy lifting. It's not a simple touch and go affair. Let it me ask requires you this. that goodwill. Of all these political leaders that you see, okay, with the exception of 
President Mwaiki, the former President Mwaiki. Mwaiki Baki got it, understood it, and knew what to do. It. There's no question about it. Him, he got it. Mm. Do you see the leaders that we currently have, uh, people who have the same get it and got it the way Kibaki had it and got it? Um, I wouldn't speak specifically to the <laughs> to I, the current I, 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 <laughs> without without mentioning names. Yeah. <laughs> Speak generally. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, I, 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 I won't speak at all. As I said yesterday, we were with Eric, and you had everyone who stood up said that the party they represent actually believes in industrialization and manufacturing. Oh, so they do. believe, and everything is great. But what we want is for people who can deliver. You know, this is it because you, so, you talk about believing. Opportunity. But if we are even going to get biblical, Phyllis, yes. after believing, you must act <laughs> so now we are stuck we seem to be stuck between this believing which is very nice you can say believe and you can sound philosophical it's great mm. but we are saying that in order to get this vehicle moving you talked about fiscal deficit debt is through the roof we have talked about this that the other thing you have an active youth population another thing that is constantly that these speeches are hinged on active youth population ready to go ready to move ready to work but then the thing needs fuel in order to go. So what more must be done beyond the conversation and the belief, I think, is now saying it's the action. And if you look at the manifesto that we, the, the, the manifesto, which is really proposals that people can include in their manifesto, we have a very clear plan with short term, medium term and long term uh, actions that need to be taken. Mm -hmm. So this is a really deep issue that. If someone is really keen on changing this economy, they must prioritize manufacturing. Is it going to happen overnight? No, it's not going to happen overnight. What is it's the short-term going... plan? What, what, what is it that, as industry, you say, in the short term, if you do this, then we start getting in the right path? Some of the immediate things is the issue of competitiveness. Hmm. A big issue is the CET review. Can we at least get the CET review out of the way? The Common External Tariff in East Africa that has been discussed for the last five years. The, the issue why that is important mm. is currently we have three bands. The three bands are limiting the ability for investors to invest in certain sectors because even if they invest, if for example I invest and it is 25% for my raw material and 25% for a finished good, why would I invest? So the CET is the basis of industrial development in EAC. Mm. We need to get that out of the way. The other thing we need to do definitely is look at the issues around cost of production all the way from the energy cost, mm. the cost of transportation, these conversations around the SGR and the fact that we are all putting our goods in on, on SGR, is it the most efficient and cost-effective way to transport our, our goods? That's something we need to look at as a country mm. and, and, and have a conversation. The other short-term one for me is the issue of regulations. Can we sit back and take stock? This is something Kibaki did at the beginning of his regime. He took stock of the entire regulatory framework and cut down regulations. We are proposing in the manifesto a better regulations commission. Can we bring down our regulations by 50%? Look at where we have duplications. Because I don't think there's anyone who sits at a place where they've done an umbrella and are saying these are all the regulations within manufacturing mm. or within business. If we are able to look and have a cleanup of regulations, that immediately starts to bring down the cost and makes it simpler for investors. If we do that, we are not just getting our local investors to believe and invest more, mm. but also attracting investors from other countries into our economy. Mm. So those are some of the Phyllis, immediate those low things line that you're foods. talking about. You know, the um, our competitiveness. Yes. Looking at the common external tariff. Looking at 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 harmonisation of our regulations. When this CSS speak to us, they tell us, you know, in fact, until the World Bank stopped doing this, we've been growing and, you know, rising higher and higher in the uh, index on doing business. Ease of doing business index. In fact, you know, we've improved X number of points, mm. X number of positions. If, Don't forget economic growth also. Uh, yes, yeah. that too. For ease of doing business, I think if you've looked at the ease of doing business parameters, first of all, they focus on starting up a business, like getting your permits and other things. And as an association, we have been saying that's not the index we need to focus on. Mm. What we need to focus on is our competitiveness. And there's actually a CIP index, a Competitiveness Industrial Performance Index by UNIDO, mm. where we are number 115 out of almost 130 something countries. That definitely is an index for us that <laughs> makes more sense because it is an index that speaks to how competitive are you to compete in the global, in the global manufacturing market. 
space. Mm. And you see, there's what, as, as you've said, there's um, the, the, the ease of doing business and other reports. But if you look at the numbers that I've shared, 115 out of, I think, 136, 140. <laughs> um, so for us, we are saying, can we focus, and you saw in our industrial manifesto, we are saying mm. that for the CIP, can we focus on improving and getting to even the top 70? Because if you look at even our GDP globally, ideally we are normally like number 90. At least can we be below um, our size of our economy? Mm. You know, yes. if we keep focusing our attention on the national government, in my mind we are missing the point completely. Yeah. Because if Governor Mur uh, Muraidi can talk about him having accessed huge funds to spur the very things we're talking about in his county, yes. this is one governor. Okay. Yes. Benchmarking <laughs> that county. How did he do it? If he can do it, other counties can do it. If he can do it, it can be done. Of course, it. Yes. Usually, you don't need it, ten examples. You need, one, you need example. one example. So, what is it that he has done that other counties can't do? I think the question is, what has he done that other governors can't do? It isn't the counties. I okay. to do. City, I agree with you. We need to move this to the counties because that's where we're going to make a difference. And the backbone of our constitution was devolution. Yes. So until we fix the issue of devolution, until we see industries around all the counties, we are not going to move the dial if we keep having the conversation only at national level. So what we've done within the manifesto, I'll take you back to that. We actually have a chapter on county industrial competitiveness and how we can set up industries. Within all the counties, we've even mapped, these are the strategic industries within your county. These are the areas you can invest in. To invest, these are the conducive conditions you need. So if we sat down and the next phase of this actually is to now engage the county governments and tell them, we want you to grow industries in your county. This is what we need to do. And there are a lot of investors, even locally, who would be happy to go to counties. I went, for example, to Lamu County mm. about um, end of last year. And they shared with us, they've mapped out the different opportunities. They've even put down the costing of what it would take to invest. You can imagine if a county like that is able to attract investors, the difference it would make on the ground. And for example, they were telling us they have the best cotton, the best quality cotton in Kenya, by the way, is grown in Lamu County. I didn't even know that myself. Mm -hmm. So if you look, and a lot of it is not even processed the, within the county. So they are looking at setting up a processing plant. And if you go to different counties, you can get... So many opportunities that we can take advantage of. So as, a, as an association, that's what we want to do also. You said we've been doing it and we want to continue to do it. And even more deliberately, work with the counties to set up industries. Have a county industrial framework. Develop county manufacturing policies with them. Because that's what is going to make the difference. You know, everything at the national government is deliberately engineered so that it is so. The entire pot is at the national government and those who control it will be a few people who know exactly how to move this, uh, the, 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 these particular figurines in the chessboard. Mm. Now, it's a long-term game as well, mm. but it guarantees the status quo and all we'll be doing is talk and talk. But at the county level, there will be individuals who will actually see it, pick it up and get something done. Get something because done. the amount of money that these counties get and the amount of money they are able to actually get and what they can leverage it's actually huge. It's huge. In fact, last year we did uh, women in manufacturing. We have a women in manufacturing program and we did WIM Machinani where we did WIM to the counties. Mm -hmm. And when you go on the ground, the amazing things people are doing, the SMEs and businesses that are starting up at the county level, it's huge. So you're right that that's where we need to capitalize our energy. As a country, let's just say our constitution was clear. It was about devolution. Yeah. Can we focus on spurring industrial development at county level? And make progress in that direction. But there's, it, it also requires, you know, now you're dealing, you, you're dealing with one national government. Then you're dealing with 47 <laughs> governments. We have regional economic blocks. All across the country, you know, there's Jumuya, your counties, Apuani, there's the uh, Lake Basin Economic, there's, what are the ones in Mount Kenya called? Mm. Those ones. Those ones. We actually don't have them. Mm. See, they're there on paper and they have secretariats in place. And they have donor support to run the secretariats. Those are the ones that should be having these conversations, but they are not. That tells you that there's a problem. You know, if we talk about just the issue of harmonization of sex of and mm -hmm. trade and taxation. And we've those, tried for 10 years. Mm. That conversation doesn't move despite people yeah. sitting together at a round table and saying, all right, you guys, we're in an economic block. We are all together, but it doesn't move. What's the problem? Uh, <laughs> um, 
<laughs> You've dealt with people who run counties. Yes. Huh? Do they strike you as the most imaginative Kenyans we have? Which is why I was telling you, we have 47. 47 different governments. But that diversity is what I, I particularly find appealing, Eric, because mm. it gives you an opportunity to find people who within that 47 will be able to actually move forward. If you leave it to these blocks, yeah. nothing will yeah. move. It's like just taking the government yeah. and bringing it that, uh, to, to that. You can use the blocks at a policy level, but if you want to set up industry and make a difference... Mm. At the ground, you'll have to work with the individual counties. The blocks are relevant for harmonization of policy, taxation, and things like that to ease movement of products and other things. But it's important to work specifically with the county governments to get things done. But the thing with this conversation is that none of this can happen on their own. You still need a national manufacturing policy, yep. a national taxation policy, but at the same time, work with the counties and ensure that they are also developing conducive en environments on the ground. But I think the big one for me is if we can move into 2022 um, and have the issue of harmonization at county level dealt with, it would be a good thing. Because we've had 10 years of devolution now. We can't keep having counties taxing you for moving your products from one county to another. When in the Constitution, at, under Article 2095, it is clear that they are not supposed to. So it's blatant disregard for the law. Phyllis, you're complicating yeah. this thing. <laughs> you're really complicating it. Mm -hmm. If within the counties that we have and within our national government and within the body of elected leaders, we have some of the most educated people bodies. If you're talking collectively, we've never had more educated people in these places. And yet when you look at the problems that we have in the counties, delivery of service, the Ethics and Anti-Corruption Commission, one of their biggest tasks, and if you read any report that the Auditor General, it is about how... Ta money is going to the counties are mismanaged. It's by these very same people. The, the, their agenda has nothing to do with progress. And it looks like a unified thought. It's like, how much are we getting? How many billions? Mm -hmm. Okay, fine. <laughs> what can we window dress to show that we're actually doing something? something. Okay. Mm -hmm. How many seminars and meetings do we need to discuss these things? Mm -hmm. How do you have a situation where people are owed money for the last God knows six, seven years and they've been doing business in the counties? But city doesn't this go down to the issue of governance and the fact that this year we have an election and as Kenyans we have an opportunity to choose again mm. and if we make the wrong choices we will have the wrong results. We always and that's make the a reality. Right, we actually make the right choices. Then what happens? I think there's it's something a bit daunting. Daunting in this sense. Huh? We seem to have given up. I'm saying we've given up because. We have accepted the status quo and the mediocrity that it comes with. So at one level, to salvage our souls, we have lofty discussions about yeah. the things we need to do and the plans, and we have them written down and we shelve them somewhere. Mm -hmm. But what we actually do are the very things that in public we castigate. So I'm saying we've given up. When that seems to be the trend that people want to get into public office for, because if you look at the numbers of people who want to, be, who want to present themselves for elections, mm -hmm. Why? It's not because they want to represent the people. That's it's because these officers represent an opportunity to plunder. But, and that's where we are. And we seem to cheer them along. So we we'll elect people who appear to be good. Yeah. But we are not unhappy with them plundering. We are only unhappy when they seem to plunder everything. <laughs> if, if they plunder, plunder just say, say up to say 40%, that we can live with. So that's our national conscience and our national values. Yes. It so, comes so, down so, so to So how, that how do we get out of it? Because it doesn't matter how many discussions we have. It's all going to boil down to that. So are you saying that uh, associations such as CAM, when they launch this manifesto and they say, this is how we can get to become an industrialized country, they should actually be selling it to the voter, not the political party, not, yeah. not those who are seeking leadership. Those uh, who are seeking leadership will say, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I hadn't but for as long as we, but, but, but the but voter, that, don't internalize don't get it, actually, mm -hmm. and hold our leaders accountable to deliver it, yep. When they talk about these things to the higher ups and the people who mm. make policies, ba ba ba, implement, mm. Mm. they should be political about it mm. and find forums where the Monainchi actually understand. So that when you're elected, they tell you, uh, excuse me, no. we know mm. this. Yep. Mm. If you leave it to the politician to tell the Monainchi, mm. it is the citizens of these counties who should be understanding that it's actually very difficult for mm. any industry to be set up here. That's why it's so difficult for us to get jobs for our people. Yes. It's so difficult for this small industry that started now because of COVID just two weeks. 
shut down and never will it come back and up. i think that speaks also to the issue in the constitution because the other pillar of our constitution is public participation yeah and the ability of the people to participate in decision making that affects their day to day mm-hmm. lives and equipping them to be able to participate effectively in that decision making i think is something that um we need to do continuously the media has a role to play and i think that's why you have these conversations as much as you do uh we have the role to play from where we sit as manufacturers to put out the information to discuss the issues and our members employ people so even having these conversations with their employees mm. and and really raising that civic awareness and responsibility um around our people i think is critical because if you look at for example what these taxes are say at county level nairobi county publishes its bill for finance every year but which of our people or even ourselves okay i do it because i work at km i have to read mm. all those bills mm. but how many of us actually get involved and go and say we actually support this or we don't right so what present i mean all of this really just seems quite daunting mm-hmm. and you know almost at a place where you're saying okay well unless attitudes and mindsets change unless there's actual implementation of what has already been put down on paper it seems to be a pretty hopeless situation what things are currently mm-hmm. on the table mm-hmm. that would still present a glimmer of hope <laughs> that something can be done um i think as we've said and i said from the beginning manufacturing output continues to grow uh the fact that we see our members continuing to expand their businesses and to invest it means our fundamentals to a level are right we have trade agreements to africa we have afcta opening up we have the opportunity to export and our goa so we have opportunities that we need to fully take advantage of and deliver on so i think what keeps the glimmer of hope is the reality that at the end of the day the opportunities are there we just need to ensure that we harness them mm-hmm. so people have to At, at the end of the day keep going and knowing that we have opportunities we did see during covid i, I think that was a difficult time mm. but that's a time i saw almost 100 industries come up in calm that were making masks um making sanitizers and other hygiene products meaning that there's room for growth we did see some sectors actually grow but what we are saying is if we continue in this trajectory we will not grow as fast as we need to mm. so mm. we will grow but if you're growing at a snail pace when you economy requires you to grow much faster that growth then doesn't make up for um Absolutely. job creation and the other opportunities that you need to present so listen, i'm holding a dagger and i want to just drive it down your back and see yes. whether you're going to bleed uh-huh. and the question that i want to ask i want to ask it after we say goodbye to the audience on KTN home which yes. is uh do your members speak with one voice are you all united as a private sector as the association of manufacturers the power you wield in determining who becomes the boss of a county who becomes the boss of the country and then the helplessness with which you speak to us about the issues that are not happening and all that is it because you're not speaking with one voice is it because there are some of your members who have other interests at the table that's a convers- that's a question i want you to answer after this we are live on KTN home we've been live for the last one hour let's take a break uh, from KTN home but the conversations continue on Spice FM around the country Nairobi Mombasa Kisumu Nakuru Eldoret Nyeri and Malindi and also live streaming on YouTube and Facebook this is the situation room the only way to start your day so there When we see these presidential candidates you know starting yes. their campaigns they seek funds and they are supported by people who are deep pocketed many of those people who are deep pocketed are actually owners of industries uh, when we see them seeking endorsement <coughs> in various regions they'll sit and meet with these owners of industries and yet you're telling me that these owners of industries are not able to influence change um i think we are agreed on the issues and that's why we actually put together the manifesto it was a rigorous process of sitting together to identify what we believe should be prioritized mm-hmm. so we are agreed on what the issues are and what needs to be done and we continuously engage and we'll continue to do so as an association because that's 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 what we do try to give a collective voice for industry so that we make progress on the things that will make a difference at farm level um companies uh, will have their their policies and who they engage with but we do try have a central conversation and a central agenda that can make progress for the delivery of the manufacturing promise so why isn't it realized because it's a long game my dear it's not something that is going to be realized within 
one year, I within two years. It. What we want, though, mm. is to see the progress over a long period of time. So if it's milestones and we say that we want to grow as a country from this percent to this percent, what is worrying for us is when we are declining instead of growing. But we are clear that it's not going to happen overnight. I get it, though, yeah. that, you know, what is constant for me yes. is the business community. It's a constant. Government comes, government goes, the business community is a con The business community that participated in, for example, drawing up the Vision 2030 is still the same one today. Mm -hmm. And we, our Vision 2030 is being implemented all haphazardly. So why is the, that community that was very strong and vocal not string as, uh, still as strong and vocal it's in influencing actual change? Be okay, I, I think I'll take us back to the beginning. Mm -hmm. The reality at the moment is the issue of the fiscal burden. Mm. Because even if we say all these rosy things, if at the end of the day, government revenues and expenditures remain what they are, we will not make progress because we will continue to tax, the regulatory bodies will continue to come up with creative ways to raise revenue and we will make progress. So the big thing is for us to together fix the macroeconomics of this country, mm -hmm. bring down government expenditure, because I think that's where our big challenge is. I was looking at the budget policy statement and the year 2019, 2018, I think we had a 3% difference from budget and actual. The following year was a 21% difference. So as long as we keep budgeting deficits and are not doing something to fix expenditure, mm. we will not do these things. Mm. So I think we need to fix the bigger picture, which is the macro, and then it will drill down to some of these actions. Probably during um, the times when there's been progress, mm. the macro issues have not been that daunting. So even when you make proposals, when... They it's come together to, at NESC and say they're able to do something. The other big thing and that we make a proposal on is the National Social and Economic Council mm. because that was also keeping us true to purpose and uh, driving the vision. Yeah. Phyllis, thank you very much for joining us. Come again as we oh, continue okay. talking about this because we must seek ways of creating jobs and uh, manufacturing is one of the key creators and drivers of job creation. Asante